So, um, it is my huge pleasure to introduce Professor Lauren Cohen, uh, our final keynote speaker of the day. Um, now, there are multiple ways to introduce Lauren. <laughs> um, uh, Lauren is the L.E. Simmons, uh, Professor of Finance at Harvard Business School. He's academic pedigree, uh, goes to University of Pennsylvania, where he did uh, a dual degree in uh, undergrad, uh, and then followed by an MBA and PhD in Chicago. Um, he has, he's an excellent researcher, has many publications in leading journals, uh, uh, too many to name, um, but many of them have been also award-winning publications, including the prestigious uh, 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 best paper award from the Journal of Finance. Uh, his research is uh, novel. It addresses novel research questions. It's beautiful in its execution and implementation, and the findings are uh, impactful for the world of practice. So that would be my summary. Uh, he, perhaps a common thread in his research is behavioral finance, but it's quite diverse, as, as you will see on, on his page. Um, uh, Lauren also serves the profession in many other different capacities. He's, uh, he goes around uh, in many global conferences as a keynote speaker. He's an editor uh, of the Review of Financial Studies, former editor of Management Science, and uh, in very many capacities uh, serves the profession. He's also an award-winning teacher um, with uh, with excellent student ratings on, uh, on uh, executive education courses, on MBA doctoral uh, programs at Harvard and elsewhere. <coughs> um, um, he's widely covered in the media, and the list goes on. But apart from all of that, um, in addition to being uh, an intellectual heavyweight, he's also a physical heavyweight. He <laughs> um, He's a nationally ranked... Uh, U.S. strongman. He's a U.S. champion on powerlifting, as you may have read. And so it's very impressive, of course, but also I'm saying this in case you have any difficult questions coming his way, yeah. maybe take that, take that into consideration. Um, another fun fact about Lauren is, um, is that he was, in his high school, a tuba player. Uh, in, in a high school marching band. <laughs> so, that, uh, so imagine that. So tuba, strongman, powerlifting, and uh, finance editor. Um, he lives with his family, uh, including six beautiful children uh, in, in uh, Massachusetts. And uh, the list goes on. So I could, I could be here. <laughs> I could spend the next 10, 15 minutes just introducing Lauren. But I'll stop here. Um, with all of that, please join me in welcoming Lauren to EFMA. Uh, uh, yeah, I'll use this guy. Armin, well, first, Armin, thank you so much for that introduction. It was absolutely fantastic. Honestly, I want to listen because I'm learning things about me. I think I want to listen for another few minutes. Uh, that was too kind. That was too kind. Um, so look, this is, uh, it's going to be a very interactive, interactive keynote, in the sense that I'm going to talk about a couple of the things that I've found so far, but I'm really excited, and kind of most excited, to hear your thoughts, right? to hear Rorschach reactions, to hear your ideas on what I'm putting up here. And that can be anything from, like, you're totally crazy, and you just like throw your drink down and walk out the door. That'd be totally cool. I hope not. But, and what you guys think are ways to push this forward. Because this really is something, and I'll get here, that we don't understand, and we need to. We need to. OK, before I do that, um, and so Armin had the beautiful, beautiful introduction of, of me. And there's one other place up here. And you'll see, look, it, what I'm going to talk about today is patent hunting. And I'll get into what that is. Uh, and it's joint work with Umit Garun, Katie Moon, and, and Paula. But you'll see up here, not only there's this Harvard Business School affiliation, but also this other one. And this is not a typo. You might think, oh my gosh, somebody like hacked into his presentation. It's a typo. It's not. So I'm also, as we speak, affiliated with the CAMED Business School. What the hell is the CAMED Business School? So 
I flew here from Phnom Penh, actually, from Cambodia. So I'm currently on a Fulbright fellowship there, helping them to build up the education system. And I am headquartered by this gracious university there called CAMED Business School, OK? And I'm writing this up here. And what I want you to do is, with your phones, I want you to take a picture of this. I'm going to try to put it up high enough, and especially the contact information. I want to tell you why. Because they're at a place in their economy right now where they're building up, and especially this business school, where it is as entrepreneurial as you can get. Okay? I've already met uh, at least seven ministries there, ministries that I didn't even think existed. They sound kind of fake. It's like ministries of socks and shoes, ministries of things. I'm like, come on, that's not a real ministry. It is ministry of trusts. They have a ministry of trust, the legal contract. And they are connected to all these places, and they want to develop. They're hungry for great ideas on how to develop. And so, honestly, to Adrian's talk from before, if you want accounting, if you want firms to literally write down everything about foreign trade and foreign transactions, they'll do it. They'll be like, yeah, that sounds cool. We'll do it. We'll make all the firms do that. They are at a point where they're really looking for great ideas, and they'll put them into practice. So please do reach out to Virak. Okay? He's excited. He wants global partners in academics, universities. He's really hungry to help build things there. And so would be incredibly grateful to receive this from you and really wants to work with you and will connect you with the right people there. Please reach out to him. Tell him that you kind of found out about him here. And I will vouch for you. OK? I'll say, yeah, they're good. They're good, Barack. OK? You can go forward with them. Um, so I'm flying tomorrow morning. I'm headed right back there to keep uh, at this. And it's something that I really think that you would get a lot of benefit from. And so send an email. Right, the cost is any one email, go for it, go for it. Okay, so this presentation, I want to talk a little bit about uh, this patent hunting and what I mean by this. And look, there are a few ways that you can do keynotes, okay, a few ways. Number one, you can kind of give the academic mountain that you've built, right? So you can sit there and talk about all your papers. Yeah, this is Cohen 2001, this is Cohen 2008, this is Cohen 2008. But my God, is that awful. That's like your academic eulogy, right? You're like writing all the things you've done, which says you're out of gas, buddy. OK? The machine's done. And so that's not what I want to do. OK? Instead, I'm going to take the opposite. I want to call to arms. OK? I want to call to the IQ, the huge amount of IQ that's in this room. I want to crowdsource that to try to attack this problem. Because I'm going to tell you, look, we've done a little bit here. But there's so much more to do and probably the way more interesting stuff, right? And so we, we've started to look at this problem, but there's so much more here. And so what is it? What is this patent hunting? What are we talking about here? Well, look, there's a fundamental chain. At its base, a fundamental chain of experimentation, search, implementation that underlies the entire innovation process. Okay. And while each element of that chain is super important to the ultimate success of whether any given idea, product, surface, whether it ends up being a huge success, right? Whether it ends up being Tesla or Alibaba or like a total clunker, the literature has essentially focused nearly all of its both IQ and, and, and really papers and thought processes around just that idea generation phase. So think here, things like basic research. Think basic research generation. Think about patents. There's a lot of work on patents. Where I've used that. We're going to use that some in this paper. But it focused just on the attributes there. Laboratory interactions among private and public sector research teams. There's a number of papers on that. Um, and just thinking about what happens right at the beginning, right? It's that garage innovator that first comes up with the idea. And then, oh, yeah, yeah, things happen afterwards. Then we get iPhones. Yeah, it's totally cool. But there's a ton that happens in between that first idea and then what we end up seeing, what we end up consuming, right? The services we get, those end products, that commercialization. And that's far less understood. Far less understood. And not only that process, but who's important in that process? And are there other agents that we can pick out and be like, holy crap, that agent's pretty dang important, and we need to understand them better. 
And so that's what we're going to start to do in this project, OK? We are going to start to look a little more into that chain, because now it turns out we have the technology to do that. We have the data to do that. And we can start to get footprints, footprints of what's going on in that chain. OK? And so what we are going to do in this paper is just modestly do exactly that. We're going to say, hey, look, iPhones are awesome. Steve Jobs is smart. But there's a ton of other stuff that happens in between, right? There's a lot of great ideas and then a lot of great end products, but there's a lot of important steps that have to happen. And it turns out we are going to show that there are key agents in this innovation system that search out neglected early stage innovations. Those are these patent hunters. And they're systematic. It's the same hunters, the same pirates we see going out and doing this time and again. And what's really cool about these patent hunters is it turns out they get paid for. And so when we look at the value in that intermediation chain, we like to think about the Isaac Newtons. We like to think about the apple hitting the head and, and hold that person up. But on average, the person who gets the lion's share, the majority, right, the plurality anyway, of the value in this distribution, in that chain, are these patent hunters. And it just highlights this, this kind of surprising fact that, hey, we always thought it was the Isaac Newton. Yeah, it'd be really cool to be the one who comes up with the idea, but it turns out hunting out others' ideas and then figuring out ways to use and implement and commercialize those, it turns out can be far more valuable. And so given that we found that person in the chain, that agent in the chain that can do this, there are probably other agents, perhaps even more critical in this process, that are worth looking into. OK, what I'm going to do, present an example, okay, a pretty detailed example, tell you the large sample results, and then jump into Q&A. Okay, so there'll be a lot of time when I'd love to get your take on, gosh, what we should look at, or what we should do more, or hey, does it work this way? Or for you to even just come up with your own ideas, and then we can chat about at the dinner, right, or another time, for sure. OK, this patent, okay, this patent. Who knows what this patent is? I'm totally kidding. No one should know what this patent is. If you've ever read patents, they're awful. They're excruciatingly like complex. You have no idea what the hell they're describing, right? Like that's the way that patents look. The way they just their way the words they use. It's not even clear they're human words, right? You're looking at them like, what the hell is that saying? Um, so this patent, it turns out, was granted to Texas Instruments in 1991. Okay, and so this patent, it turns out, even though it was granted in 91, nobody paid attention. Nobody paid attention to it until 15 years later, when another firm came along called NVIDIA, and they're like, hey, CI, I think you got something. OK? NVIDIA went into the flea market, right? That's how I like to think about them. There's this like garbage bin of patents that no one's looked at for like 10 years, 15 years. They go in, search through, sift through, say, hey, actually, that's a good idea. We can do something with that. And it turns out they do. And so there's one other thing I want to highlight here, that this patent, it was in this technology class of electric digital data processing and image data processing. That's going to be important because I'm going to tell you what this patent actually ended up being the foundational patent for. But in terms of its proximity, this is a proximity measure, a distance measure, where the larger it is, it means the closer it is to that firm. So what you can see here is that even though TI, the creator of this, it was about a 0.13 closest, it was actually much closer to the hunter, right? Much closer to this NVIDIA that ended up hunting out this technology. And so, what does that look like? Well, here, this is we're a, a measurement of the citations, okay? The mass of citations of this patent. And like I mentioned, when it first started, nobody gave a hoot about this patent, okay? This thing came out, and people are like, yeah, yeah, who cares? Okay, and they kept doing what they were doing in 1991. What were they doing in 1991? I don't know, probably playing with the Nintendo, but they certainly weren't citing this patent. Okay, and they continued to not cite this patent for a very long time until this. This is a big jump up. 2006, again, 15 years later, we see NVIDIA come in and just really start to hype up this patent. Okay? And I want to point to one other interesting pattern you see here. NVIDIA started to hype up this pattern, 2006. Okay? Who caught on much later? Apple. All these A's are Apple. 
So Apple's like, yeah, this definitely is awesome. Okay? Now, what is this patent? Well, this patent is none other than one of the foundational patents to GPU, okay, to graphical processing units. Okay, these, these graphical processors. Now, what are these GPUs used in? Well, a ton of awesome stuff. And so you'll see two spikes in the data actually here for an NVIDIA. Why did NVIDIA actually get into this in the first place? Okay, in terms of their uh, semiconductor firm and thinking about this, why did they get into GPUs? Well, not for the reason why today you see another explosion in GPUs and why now NVIDIA, by the way, just became, I think, what is it, the third company to be a trillion dollar firm? I think they just passed the trillion dollar mark. They're the third firm. Okay? And so this, by the way, if we didn't keep graphing this, if we did, it would be like up here somewhere. It would be like up there, wherever a trillion is, okay? So, but why did they do this in, the, in this 2006? Why do you see this first spike up when they start to use it? Well, that was video games. Okay? So GPU first came pretty important for these video gaming systems and this explosion in video games that we saw. And then, again, here, of course, with AI, artificial intelligence, machine learning, anything that's that pro that is that kind of heavy in the use of these types of tools uses a lot of GPU capacity. And that's today why you see all these firms, why you see Apple and all these other firms really diving in to these patents. But again, NVIDIA is a trillion dollar firm. You know who isn't a trillion dollar firm? Texas Instruments. Okay? Even though they're the ones that came up with this idea. Again, the idea was theirs, and yet the hunter, the hunter, is the one that got the spoils. And so that's what we do in this project. What we start to look at is saying, hey, look, who are these hunters? Are they systematic? Do they kind of, is it just a one-off thing, or do they do this a lot? When they do this a lot, is there some skill set? Are these certain kinds of firms? Do they do it at certain times? Can they do it on certain types of firms? In other words, if you hold something really close to your chest, it's really hard for me to hunt that, right? It's got to be kind of out there enough for me to grab it. I like to think about this as there was this great uh, game, I don't even know if they make it anymore, called Hungry Hippos. And so Hungry Hippos was a game where like you each, everyone had a hippo. I'm going to explain this really bad, but I'm going down with the ship on this, okay? So it was essentially we all had our own little hippo, and our, we wanted our hippo to like eat as many of the little balls as we could, and all the balls that's in there, and you wanted the hungriest hippo around. So you wanted your hippo to go like eat all the balls, and you could only eat the balls that were closest to you though, right? So if all the balls were closest to John, I couldn't get John's balls, and so I had to like really like creep over them. And so like the hippo is... With the patent hunters, that's exactly what we find, is that they're out there, and it's the same patent hunters we find out that are able to go in and grab these, but they can only grab them at certain strategic times and from certain strategic other players. Okay? And so let me kind of broaden this then to the universe of firms. Okay? Among the top 5% cited patents during the 20 years since grants. And so why are we using that? We call these killer patents. In past literature, they've called these blockbuster patents. You can call them whatever you want. Here's what's important about them, what you need to know. These top 5%, the way the citation distribution looks like in patents is actually not dissimilar to what it looks like for academic papers. Okay? And so the median number of citations to an academic paper does anybody know what it is that's published even in top journals? Do you know what that is amongst top journals? We can even take top three financial. It used to be one, okay? It used to be one. I'm not, that's not, and by the way, I'm not leaving out any like multiplier, like one times e to the tenth. No, 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 one, one, single, one, one, okay? I'm only up the right finger. I think maybe recently it's gone up to two, but like the point is, is a professional growth. The point is, it's super small. So if you look at the citation distribution, most articles get almost nothing. It's like a flat line. And then a very small percentage get a very large number of citations, right? And so then there's this huge convexity at the end of the distribution. Patents are the same way, okay? Most patents are total throwaways, okay? We just passed the 11 million, 11 million mark for U.S. patents, okay? I want you to count the number of really transformational inventions there have been in the last 40 years, and it's like seven. Okay, and so we have 11 million patents. There, by the way, in this thing, in this thing alone, there are over 300,000 patents for this and counting. Okay, so there are many patents can go into the same commercialized item, especially as it evolves over time. And so 
given that the distribution looks like that, what the literature has found is that the top 5%, that convex piece, the piece right at the right tail of the distribution, those are the ones that are significantly more likely to correlate with stuff we care about, right? Commercialized products and things that are valuable. And so that's why we say, okay, look, let's try and look at just those ones, just those ones that are valuable and that end up in commercialized products. Well, it turns out we can kind of separate those into early bloomers and late bloomers. Okay, early bloomers are the ones people realize right at the beginning are amazing and they start citing. And late bloomers are like the GPU patents, right? The things actually, no, 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 people didn't realize immediately. And it takes something or someone, and we're going to show that someone, that patent hunter to come in and say, yeah, I see something in that. I see something in that patent that we're then going to turn in to these types of realizations I'm going to talk about. So it turns out when these late bloomer patents and ideas do surface, they're often accompanied by new markets, okay? So late bloomer patents are associated with about a three and a half uh, increase, three and a half product increase in new products, and about a seven and a half percent increase in innovation in the technology space. In other words, they kind of open up technology spaces in really interesting ways. And these patent hunters, they're the ones that come in and find them, okay? They're early adopters and finders of these late bloomer patents. And for that, they get spoils, okay? They get rents from that. What are the rents that they get? Well, we're going to show that on average, they get these sales growth, Tobin's Q, and product increases, right? Much like we saw with NVIDIA, okay? And in fact, and I think this is one of these really interesting points, their benefits on average, on average, exceed that of the patent writers. On average, ex post, now of course this is hard to do ex ante, but I'm going to make an ex post statement here. On average, ex post, you would rather have been the TI, or, or sorry, the other way around, you'd rather been NVIDIA than TI. You'd rather be the one hunting the patent than writing it. And so we'll talk about these equilibrium frameworks of why, gosh, why do you even have a TI then if everybody would rather be the NVIDIA? And we're going to show reasons why both of them can exist, right? Why you'd have a TI writing these types of patents. But I'm going to tell you first what they look like. So who are the TIs of the world? Who are these patent writers that get their ideas kind of taken away by the hunters and then created? Well, these are firms that tend to be older, larger value firms. So think here like IBM, like Texas Instruments, whereas the hunters tend to be these smaller, consumer-focused growth firms. Okay, NVIDIA, TiVo, these types of firms tend to be the firms that are hunters, and this is hunters on average. I'm going to show this is a firm-specific effect. Okay, it's not only a persistent firm-specific effect, but there's a learning component, which is kind of cool, which is to say the first patent you hunt is pretty good. The second you get a little bit better, you get even more rents from the third, the fourth, and so we see this moving up the learning curve going on with these patent hunters. And not only do we see that at the firm level, that's true at the individual inventor level. So one cool part about patents is that you can actually see who within the firm invented this idea, who came up with the idea. And so what we can see is that firms that hire, first with this regard, firms that hire inventors of the patent that they hunt, they get even larger rents. So there's some technology to this where the person matters. And secondly, Individual inventors who patent hunt, right, who go out there and find other patents to do this with, they continue to do so across different firms they work for. So if they did it for NVIDIA and then they get hired by Apple, they do it for Apple too. They do it for Apple too. The same inventors at the inventor level, the person level. So it seems to be some individual person characteristic to this as well. Now, in rationalizing the equilibria, it turns out these initial neglected patents, which are hunted, much like that NVIDIA and TI example, they're the ones that are further away from what the individual writer is doing. And not only are they further away from some technological standpoint, they're also in not currently competitive spaces. Right? So you could imagine a TI being like, oh yeah, who cares about this GPU thing? It's not even a real thing. It's like it exists on planet Mars, but not here on Earth. 
Like, why do we care? We can neglect this patent for a little while because nobody's swimming in that pool, right? We don't have to worry about someone taking it away. There's no competition there anyway. And so you can see how these can end up being these neglected spaces. Um, and lastly, we find that they can then both exist, and having them both turns out is all. OK, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the data we use to come up with this. And I'm going to talk through some of these examples, and then we're going to jump right into Q&A. Yeah, do you want? Yeah, we'll jump right in afterwards, yeah, if that makes sense. So um, I'm going to quickly kind of talk through the data, show you a few pictures, and then I'm really looking forward to the questions. OK? So uh, what do you need to know before we jump there? Well, look, killer patents, like I mentioned before, are those patents that just get a ton of citations. OK? So killers are these ones that, over time, really catch fire. And non-killers are the opposite. Okay? They're the ones that just over their entire life never really catch on. Okay? And then the other distinction is that early versus late bloomers. And again, most of the patents that end up being killer patents are those that people recognize immediately. Okay? And you can see that in this distribution. Most of the, these are now just the killer patents. When do they amass their citations? Well, most of the ones are the ones that people figure out immediately. Yeah, that's awesome. We want to innovate on this. And yet, we're going to focus on these late bloomers, the ones that were left out in the cold, right? The ones that you find, again, at like an antique show or like a flea market 10 years later, 15 years later. And it turns out those patents, on average, are more highly cited patents. On average, they're going to have a higher impact, which didn't have to be true, right? Ex post, they didn't have to have higher citations. In fact, one might expect that ex post, they have lower, given that they started out with almost zero and kept at zero for a while, whereas these early bloomers are the ones that immediately kind of took off. And yet, after the fact, after that 20-year period when the patent expires, on average, these, are, these late bloomers have more citations and are going to have more impact by other measures we look at, too. OK? Now, what's the difference between these patents that we need to know empirically? Look, there's a lot of numbers here. There's not much to focus on, except that ex ante, it's hard to tell the difference between them. OK? Ex ante, it's not like you can say at day one, ah, I know this is going to be a late bloomer, this is going to be an early bloomer. No, no, no. There's nothing you can really tell on day one. Okay, and in terms of the patents that then cite these, we see a very similar type of kind of difference, except that we've, we see that these late bloomer patents ex post, again, are these kind of broader patents. They go into neglected areas, and they end up being more broadly uh, impact, impactful. Okay, and... This kind of this other thing, and again, I'm going through the tables kind of quickly because we already talked about the main results here. Um, look, who are these firms that go out and hunt these products? Well, they tend to be firms that are both more producing concentrated, so they produce more new products, and they spend a little bit more on their consumer-facing business. Okay, they're a little more consumer-facing, and they're firms that produce more products. Okay, now. Again, the writers are firms like we talked about before, like Johnson Johnson, IBM, General Electric. Okay? They're firms that have big R&D departments, but we can think about these types of firms as being very broad and yet having these patents that might get neglected okay? and being these large value firms. And so, look, I'm going to jump right into some of these results just to kind of to, to reinforce what we talked about before. So first, the benefits from hunting these, these late bloomer patents. Okay? And these are all relative. These regressions are going to be now relative to just the writers of the patent. So think about this regression as just comparing the PI to NVIDIA, okay? the firm that wrote it versus the firm that, that hunted it away in some sense. And what you can see is that the new products jump up significantly for this firm. And so what does this coefficient imply? It implies about a 15% increase in the number of new products by this hunting firm. Okay? It suggests that, hey, we're taking this 
patent, and after we hunt that patent, after we get that GPU pen, we're creating about 15% more products, which ends up being about three and a half products. Okay, three and a half new products for that firm. In addition, we see this significant increase in both sales growth and Tobin's Q for that firm, again, for that NVIDIA relative to TI. Okay, and these are large in economic magnitude too, as you can see here. These are big differences. Okay, and this is getting at this idea that, hey, look, um, these things that they're going out and hunting, they're not just hunting it, but also putting a lot of other resources behind them. And we can see that in the new products and then the realizations here. Okay, and yet the benefits really come to hunting those late bloomer patents. So what's kind of cool about this is you can't go out and then just be like, oh yeah, that patent everybody else is citing, I'm going to cite that too, and I'm going to get a ton of benefits from that, right? Like, you can't be the, the, this person who goes out and tries to create something that's already been created by other people, that's already been cited by so many other people, right? That's already been used so many times, and then be like the hundredth user. There are not rents to doing that. They're not the same rents. So going out and hunting that late bloomer patent is really unique in the benefits that you get. And that kind of makes sense because, of course, there's some search cost we think that you have to pay for that. And there are benefits from doing so. Okay? And now, in thinking about this in terms of opening up new classes, and so I just want to talk through this figure because I think it's interesting to think about what happens with this late bloomer patent. This is the technology proximity of the new products and the new patents that are opened up after citing one of these killer patents. And again, this is just comparing killer patents, just comparing the blockbuster patents, just comparing the ones that both kind of take off. This is early bloomers versus late bloomers. Okay? And what we can see here is once the early bloomers are cited, this is before their citation, right before their, their killer year, and then afterwards, we don't see much difference here, right? Kind of just bumps along. Whereas we see this significant rise afterwards. What does that significant rise mean? It means that after they create, after they've found this patent, we see a blooming of the technology closer to them. So in some sense, they create a new class of technology, a new class of ideas and innovation spaces going on here, where we just see much less going on here, right? It just kind of puts along in the same general trend. Now, this is that same idea, but in a regression, but again, kind of reinforcing this idea that somehow there's something special about what's going on when these patent hunters come in to hunt down these patents. Okay? Now, which patents are hunted by users? Right? We talked about this, but I want to reinforce it here. Well, it turns out the patents that are hunted are the ones that are closest to the patent hunter. So again, going back to that example, closest to Texas Instruments and furthest away, or, sorry, closest to NVIDIA and furthest away from Texas Instruments. So they hunt the ones that are closest to what they're doing and furthest away so that these are ones that can be released by the individual writer. Okay? Exactly as we might think, these are the patents where they think that the relative value for hunting is the highest. Okay, the lowest competitive threat and the ones that are closest to these hunters' technology sources. So this is all kind of lining up in a way we might think about that innovation path being created. Right? And ex ante, right, if we can think about this problem in general, how does this happen? Well, the way it happens is that when you create new ideas, you're not exactly sure how they're going to fit in. You don't know exactly, gosh, I'm going to use this tomorrow. Am I going to use it in five years? Is it definitely going to be related to what I'm doing? Well, you think it is ex ante. There's a probability of it. So that's why you create it at IBM or at Bell Labs or one of these other firms, but you don't know. And yet, given that uncertainty, you're going to create this mass of ideas, and it turns out some of these might be far more helpful for other firms. They might be far more helpful maybe once the world has developed a new idea that allows it to unlock that idea you came up with. But at that point, it's so far away from what you're doing or what you were doing that maybe someone else realizes that when you don't. And that's how these types of equilibria can happen. And what this is showing is that that ability to do that 
is in some ways even more important than the ability to come up with the idea in the first place. Okay? So in kind of thinking through this idea of persistence of this, I just want to show you here, it turns out that about 50% of patent hunters remain patent hunters. So this is a persistent characteristic. Patent hunting is something which when you see firms doing it, the same firms are going to do it over and over again. And again, they get better at it over time. Okay? This is this result that I mentioned before. I'll just quickly show you that it turns out when you get the inventor to move with you, that you get an even higher bump in sales growth than Tobin skew. So somehow, if I can hire away the TI inventor, and we can see on that contract, it's so cool, is that on some of these patents, I hire the scientist who came up with it over to my firm, to NVIDIA, and some that I don't. And in cases where I do hire the inventor over, then it turns out there are even larger bumps. Now, of course, there's an endogeneity here, right? Like you may say, okay, in those cases where they hire the inventor over, they care more about it, so they're investing more resources in factories. They're investing more resources in other types of things which can support it. And that's definitely true, but it looks like the inventor is at least a piece of that, right? The human behind it is a piece of that technological function which can allow them to exploit that. Uh, and that lastly, I think in some ways this is even more interesting, this is that the inventors who are able to do this, who are able to hunt out patents, that's something they keep their entire careers. They do it at Apple, they do it at, at NVIDIA, right? They do it at Google, and when they move firms, they continue to have that technology, that ability to go to that patent flea market and kind of pick out the winners again and again and again. And so because we get to see who's doing this, we get to see this is not just a firm characteristic, but instead that inventor characteristic who can do this time and time again. Okay, so there seems to be some skill involved that's persistent over the career. Um, and this kind of last piece, and then I want to open it up for Q&A. Look, it turns out there's an advantage to being a TI or I should say there's an advantage to being close enough to a TI to hunt their patent earliest, right? Because if someone got in before NVIDIA, they might have been able to hunt this patent. And in fact, they had 14 years, 14 years before NVIDIA did it, someone else could have come in and early hunted. Okay, so hunting, it turns out, it's also good, even though it's been neglected for a while, to be that first one who comes in. And early hunters get more benefit than late hunters, okay? Than people who do hunt out this patent but don't get it quite as early as the one who was there before. Now, are there costs to doing this? Well, there are those costs that I mentioned from before, okay? So less experienced, in hunt less experienced hunters do worse. Uh, if you have too many from the same, in other words, if there are too many people hanging around, then you get a lower rent. And there are these rents that we might expect and the kind of cost of this in much the way that you might think costs to this patent hunting work. So, like I mentioned, look, this is at its initial phases. And in, and in my opinion, this is what a keynote address should be, right? It should be something that's not something that's already done, that's like 19th round at Econometrica, that's right there, just waiting for me to like come and be like, oh, does anybody have any suggestions on where I should put the I's and T's in the paper or what color I should use on the graph? This is really initial work. Okay, this is really at the stage. There is not even a paper to this yet. Okay, I would be happy to hand out the paper, but it doesn't exist. Okay, we're at this point where we're just starting to scratch the surface on this topic that needs a lot more than surface scratching. Okay, because this is literally, when we think about innovation and coming up with ideas, that's what we do for a living. And that's how a lot of the most important problems get solved in the world. And yet what we understand and what we've studied up to this point is this and then realizations. And this, it turns out, is a pretty darn important part. Of it. We haven't looked at it yet. Now, the takeaway so far, though, that we've established, and then I'm going to open it up, that 
we look at here the universe, okay? Millions of interconnected patents we look at. Over the past five decades, to provide this insight, a little bit of insight on that fundamental chain of experimentation, search, and implementation. And namely, we find that these patent hunters amassed pretty large rents from hunting out neglected patents. And those are rents in terms of new products, in terms of sales growth, and Tobin's Q, okay, market value. The patents they search out tend to be closer to what they do, their core, and further away from whoever wrote this, from who they're hunting it from along with being, in that moment, in less competitive idea and innovation spaces. Okay, this is a persistence characteristic, but it has a learning component, so you get better at it as you do it. It also appears to have inventor level components, right? As patent hunters, patents that are hunted, are more valuable when they're tied to inventors, along with, again, inventors that do this, kind of doing it no matter where they are. It appears to have spillovers for the system in terms of creating more attention, innovation, new product development to that space that they've hunted out, right? Think about that GPU space now, which is flourishing, okay? And then moving this forward, look, this is a rich area for future research, okay? A rich area in that this is a white space. We're just beginning to scratch the surface on what goes on in that, that complex bridge that I talked about who the winners are, who the losers are, has yet to be fully mapped out or understood. Moreover, the times, industries, and competitive environments in which certain players and strategies can win, right, because it's very much this kind of game theoretic strategy, uh, it's yet to be understood or explored. And yet it has to be if we're going to understand how to move this forward. So look, you're all much better researchers than I am, and so we need you on this. Okay, We need you. In fact, everybody should drop literally everything else they're doing, including you, Adrian, and start researching the innovation chain, okay? And if you don't have your laptop site yet, you should, okay? What are you waiting for? All right, look, uh, thank you, everyone, so much for your time and attention, and I'm really looking forward to diving into the Q&A. Thank you so much. Okay, and so with that, I think we have a microphone here. Is this turned on? Let's see. Is this, well, the other one is? All right, Oof. we'll take this. All right, Armin, my man. You got it? That's my guy, that's my guy. All right, let's go. We have, we have a number of questions, yes. Can we start from the big area? I like it, that's a good optimization. Yeah, yeah, please. And if you could just say what your name is, too, that'd be fantastic. Yes, yeah. Uh, uh, Stefano, um, I have a few related questions uh, uh, regarding more of the writers than uh, the, the hunters. Yes. So the first one is, uh, if you have any evidence or uh, hints at when a hunter becomes a writer, if ever, in other words, if there's a sort of life cycle story, Factory, so they they produce a lot of patents because eventually some of these will come to fruition. I think they will earn royalties out of that, and, and it will. I wouldn't say three months, but it, it doesn't have to. It doesn't yeah. have to be long term problems. Yes, perfect. And so, Stefano, can I get your last name? Just a yeah. Thank you. B O N I N I. Okay. Perfect. Thank you so much, Stefano, for the question. So let me kind of address both of them. So first, uh, on the life cycle. And so I love this idea of looking at the life cycle. So we haven't looked at it much, but we do see some hints of firms kind of moving over this. In other words, firms starting as hunters, then morphing into like this mixed stage where they're hunters and writers. And then we can look at stages where they then kind of lose the ability to hunt and become just writers. And I'm so glad that you mentioned one of these firms. I'll give you an example of this. But look, uh, 
this one we probably should keep, well, look, we'll keep between us, okay? Uh, and so I'll give you an example of one of these firms. So I've done some work on, on patent, these things called patent trolls in the US. What these patent trolls are, non-practicing entities, are these firms that essentially they don't produce anything, but they just sue other people for the patent rights that they have, right? And so they essentially just amass patents, often groups of lawyers, and they just amass patents and they just sue everybody saying, yeah, you infringed on our patent. So why are they able to do this? And this gets to your second point. The reason they're able to do this is because patents look like the document I had up. And so unlike physical property, where if you and I have a fence between our farms, we can tell very, you know, very much, very clear, where your farm ends and where my farm begins, and we can say, okay, this is your property, this is mine. The intellectual property space is this weird amorphous space where it's like it's hard to tell where your idea stops and my idea starts. And that's why they're able to have these lawsuits, you know, multi-million, hundred million dollar lawsuits, where I say, oh no, you infringed on my patent with your product, and you say, no, I didn't, and here's why, and then we enter into these really big legal battles. And so because of that, that leaves the scope for this type of thing. But what it also does is it means that I'll get to your second point in the first one, that patent licensing and purchasing is incredibly rare. So it turns out, rather than having to license from you, what I end up doing is I can just cite your patent, and that happens much more often. And so I don't have to do an official licensing, because in order for you to say, oh yeah, Lauren, you have to license my patent, you have to prove that your patent in particular was important and somehow was exactly what I needed in my commercial product and not my idea, which is close to yours, in order to produce it. And that's a very long litigation process. And the reason why uh, most producing firms don't do this as much is that you have this problem where it's a game theoretic, usually suboptimal strategy, because the second you sue me, I'm gonna sue you back. And then we're gonna tie each other in court. Think Apple and Samsung, and so rather than that, it's like mutually assured destruction, and so we both have nuclear weapons, and we just decide not to use them. Whereas the th great thing about patent trolls is they're just lawyers that don't produce anything, so they can sue people at will, and then they're like, yeah, sue me back. For what? You can only sue me if I commercialize something. I don't commercialize anything. And so they have this great threat at their disposal. Now, that being said, that's all a long way to say this life cycle idea I think is a great one, and we're going to look into, because I'll give you the life cycle of a patent troll. So today, Today, there's a lot of, of legislation, and so I've, I've helped the USPTO and the US government and some other uh, European patent office, some others think about this, uh, around patents and around trying to squash patent trolls. And funnily enough, the companies who are big supporters of that are most technology firms. Google, Apple, you think about this, Microsoft. They're all like, yeah, let's get rid of these patent trolls. They're terrible, they're affecting what we do. Funnily enough, I thought, God, who is it, like Google versus the Patent Trial Lawyers Association? Like they must squash them, right? It must be clear that all the money's coming in behind this. No, no, no. You know who loves patent trolls and keeping patents strong? Pharma companies. Pharma companies live on strong patents. So this is Merck, Pfizer, all these other companies. They want very strong patent rights. They don't want you to erode even a little bit of patent rights because that's how they make their billions and tens of billions. So it ends up being like infinity dollars versus infinity dollars, and like no one wins. Well, somebody jumped. Somebody jumped, and this is the evolution of a tech company. And so someone very quietly moved from the side of supporting the tech firms to now being pro-patent trolls because they themselves have become one, and that's IBM. IBM has now moved over. IBM now license their patents. They literally will say, okay, Stefano, we're going to license our patent to you for free, and you're going to go out and sue all of our competitors. And we're going to try to create these shell companies and put them in such weird ways that we can't tell. But essentially, they have now moved. The life cycle of IBM is now they're just trying to enforce based on what they've done in the past. They're living off their old hits, and they're like, yeah, we're not going to come up with anything new. Let's just like enforce our old stuff. And so this idea of the life cycle, I think, is a fascinating one, and we should definitely look into it. Thank you. It's a great question. <laughs> I can, I, I can, I can promise to give every response under an hour and a half. Okay, that is the only thing I can do. Yes. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Please. Nadia Masood from Melbourne University. Yeah. Uh, great presentation. Entertaining. 
Um, I just have a comment and a tangent question. My comment is related to the patent hunter. They are very common in crypto market. And if you look at Bitcoin, it is a good example uh, to use as well. Um, the other question I have is related to the patent creation itself. So what is the incentive for the firm actually to create patent? If you look for the late bloomer, it's like creating a public good for the economy. So why you patent um, specific idea if you think Right? It's, it's, it, you're not benefiting from it right away. Yes. And so, Nadia, thank you so much. I think this is a great question. And so, there are these other things that you can have, things like um, what they're called trade secrets, right? Or other things where, hey, I don't have to tell you about this, but I can just keep it within the firm. Now, what's the downside of doing that? The downside of doing that is what a patent is, actually, is a defensive legal contract. So, people are like, oh, yeah, patents let you create a bunch of awesome stuff. No, 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 no. Yeah, actually what a patent does is it just allows you to block other people from creating awesome stuff. So if you want to, you can just leave your field. Let's use, again, our field analogy, okay? Um, which is terrible, but again, I'm just gonna use it. It's if you want to just let that field grow weeds and like not ever produce anything on it, that's your prerogative. And so what some people do is strategic defensive patenting where they say, I, you know what? I'm gonna patent this space because I know you want. And I'm actually not going to do anything here, but I know you could get value from this. And so I'm going to prevent you, I'm going to block you from innovating in this space for the next 20 years. Now, in these instances, I don't think it's that because they're not blocking these people. What they're doing is they really think, gosh, over the next five years or 10 years, we might develop in these 10 spaces. And then they just get distracted by another one, right? Or they choose the thing closest to their core and they forget about this. And they ex ante think it's a high enough probability they'll go there that they want to put it. And there's a low enough probability anyone's going to steal it because no one's competitive there and they miss out. It's like a miscalculation on their side or something where they get picked up afterwards. And I think what's so neat about this, Nadia, at this space is that these, what? Short time? Yeah. So I'm get, it's, I only have another six minutes on this one. No. So what's so cool about this is that the ones who pick it up on average do better than them. So it, you're completely right. Maybe if they knew about this, maybe they didn't know about this. So once this paper comes out, then they're going to hold a lot more into trade secrets or it might change in equilibrium how they do it. Thanks so much. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, uh, please. Hi, Lauren. Um, my okay, okay. <laughs> well, please, please. Okay, but name, name first. Name, name. Your name's clarification. That's a weird one, but I'll go with that. No, well, <laughs> what's your name? Yeah, yeah, very quickly. Okay. Yes. Yes, yeah, they do. Yeah, yeah, no, that's very important. It's within that 20 years where they're not expired. Okay, right. so that's why we use the 20 years. So it's very interesting to ask what happens when patent expires. How much hunting, how much what? And then if you are not addressing it, are the hunters changing the world? Or the hunters are consequential in the changes to the world? Do the environment change to make the patents relevant? Yeah. Also, your analysis has implications regarding the negotiation. If the patent is alive and it's true, again, I imagine there is some negotiation between the hunter and the owner and the writer. So your result, as far as who's making more money, is about the equilibrium of this negotiation. And finally, there is another story that I was familiar with about all these big value firms that you mentioned rejecting even A&M University. Yeah. There are many, many academics in Texas story about huge invention that huge corporation rejected. And I, I want to give you an example. I'm sure you know better than Yes, yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, and so, yes. Well, my name is David Feldman from German Seven in Sydney. Perfect. All right, David, thank you so much. So, look, um, and so I, I, I think both those ideas, let me just kind of quickly pick up on the last two. Um, are the hunters changing the world or are they just responding to a changed world? And I agree with you. I think it's probably some continuum. Here's just some little piece of evidence they're, they're at least changing, maybe a changing world, right? And so maybe it's their second derivative, maybe they're just increasing the change, is that this is a space that was not competitive before, didn't really exist before, and after they start to patent there, then a bunch of other people start to patent. So it looks like they're at least a catalyst to this changing world, right? Whether they're just responding to the gasoline being there and they're the flame, or they're the flame that then attracts people to pour gasoline on, I agree with you. It's kind of interesting, and we're not sure exactly which it is, but they do seem to establish that. Um, and second, that really, what, what you said prompted our idea in some ways to look at if when they steal the person away, does this become more valuable at the firm that they are? And we find that it is. And so maybe some of this is them stealing them away. Maybe some of this is pissed off inventors that are like, I've been telling IBM for years they had to develop this, and they put me in the basement, and they wouldn't develop my ideas. Now that this other firm is doing it, I'm going to go away and develop it at this new firm. And so we kind of see evidence at least consistent with that, although it would be cool to look into more of these if we can get disgruntled employees that will tell us, yeah, I'm doing this because they, they kind of pushed me away. All right, Armin, I think we have time for one more question. So yeah, let's, let's end right here. Yeah, please. Hello, Lauren. My name is Michael Tan, and we had dinner before when you visit NYU five years ago. I'm now with the Florida International University. Uh, and like you, I'm also on my Fulbright visit at the Ishkte University Institute of Lisbon. So what a treat. Nice, <laughs> so, fantastic. Yeah, I just have two comments regarding your findings that the late boomers have higher returns than the early boomers. Uh, number one, I'm thinking maybe there is a self-selection. Uh, for, uh, for early boomers, maybe the average quality of patents that people are looking at is tend to be lower than late boomers that uh, patents that survive and continue to be looked at, uh, you know, uh, uh, via the means of self-selection tend to be a higher quality. So maybe you can look at within the subsample of the early boomers that continue to be cited over a longer period of time and then compare those two. And the other related comment is uh, the other possibility, kind of inspired by your tax, uh, Texas Instruments example. You know, when you think about economic, uh, technological advancement, they tend to happen in a step function, right? It takes a long time for there to be technological breakthrough. So maybe uh, the success story that you document <laughs> in your uh, anecdotal example that only happens after uh, the technological breakthrough create that setting or environment for the patent to have a huge breakthrough where those opportunities doesn't exist for early boomers. Yes, yeah, and so Michael, thank you so much. I think both of those are great comments. I think on the first one in particular, the, the late bloomers, again, these are not ones that survived that long. These are ones that were dead. They didn't, nobody cited them, right? Like these were stuck in a corner, these were dusty, like nobody looked at these things. So it's not like we had some selection in that these are the ones that already showed that everybody liked them and could last that long. On your second point though, I love this idea of thinking about this kind of technological advances and it's a little bit before on the world changing. Like it would be great to see a catalyst patent to these patents, right? Could it be that something happened that unlocked the ability of the patent hunters to then take them in some sequential step function? And so we'll definitely look into that more. Thank you so much. And look, I want to thank everyone uh, once again for all of your wonderful comments and your care and suggestions. I look forward to chatting about it at dinner and to seeing the things you come up with. Thanks so much again, everyone. I really appreciate it. Um, on behalf of the conference, I want to thank Lauren again for a very insightful, fascinating talk, Q&A. And it really lived up to its promise. Thank you very thank much. Thank you so much.